I, I mean, the talk, the founder of Charity Excellence. Uh, I think my worst meeting ever was when, as commercial director, I sat in a room with a dozen accountants. Uh, there were no decisions made at all. Um, at the five hour point, I was on the point of throwing myself onto the desk to impale myself on my biro in the hope of being stretchered out of the room when it ground to a hideous and unedifying halt. However, meetings are actually a really good way to run an organization effectively. But like anything else in life, there's a right way and a wrong way, and there are certain skills required to do it. So what this video is going to do is going to walk you through the whole thing around being in a meeting. So if you can stick in this meeting for the next 30 minutes, I will give you your life back for the rest of your career, as long as you're the one doing the chairing, obviously. So what we're going to talk about, the benefits. How do you know you're doing it well if you know what you're doing it for? We really need to be clear about that. And the costs. We tend to just turn up at meetings. Actually, there is a very real cost to having a meeting. Is the benefit more than the cost? Because if it ain't, why are we doing it? Setting it up to be successful. How the chair needs to manage it to get the best out of the meeting. But we're all responsible. We don't just turn up and whinge about it being a bad meeting. We are part of that meeting. We have a role to play in making it effective. And the follow on stuff that people tend to forget about because they're too bottled out by the meeting. So what are the benefits of holding a meeting? Yeah, it's a meme. We all laugh at them and God knows we've all been there. So the benefits, making decisions. I've sat in three hour meetings where nobody did that. You're not making a decision, what are you doing? Debating issues, getting on the table, thrashing things out, finding out information you need, hearing what people think, are they on site, are they against it, coordinating activities, particularly across function. You need the comms guys and the fundraisers and the, the operations people in the room so that they're all working together. Developing team working. It is a good way to bring people together and build that sense of team, build that shared goal, become a single project team and achieving consensus around an issue. If it's <clears throat> really contentious, getting people around the table and managing that and managing expectations and meeting people needs as far as you can is a good way to do it. And just sharing information, weekly updates. So what's the cost? There can be travel costs. You know, pe people driving around the country, going to meetings and staying in hotels. Um, time is generally the biggest cost of a meeting. It becomes much more expensive if you have every week or every month. If there's a bucket load of people around the table. If they've had to travel a long way. And if it lasts a long time and you multiply them all together. What does that look like, okay? A weekly two hour meeting, that's not unheard of. 10 people, that's not unusual. 30 minutes travel time, it's a thousand hours a year. And we're all massively overworked. So if you're gonna spend a thousand hours a year in that room, let's make sure that what it's paying back is far in excess of the cost of doing that. Two ways to do it, really. One is reduce the cost. The second way is to get maximum benefit out of the meeting. So these are the two things that we can do. So preparing for a successful meeting. Be really, really clear what the point of the meeting is. And everyone that's going there understands what the point of the meeting is purpose of this meeting is to do this. If you don't know what you're there for, it ain't going to happen. Invite those that need to be there. I've, I've seen and I've been invited to meetings and I, I've said to people, why am I here? And they've said, well, we always invite you. What am I bringing to the meeting? Do I need to be part of this? Do I need to know this? Well, not really. Oh, okay. Do you mind if I go? So don't necessarily work on an absolute standard set of invitations, invite the ones that need to be there. 
don't invite too many people if they all need to speak or if you need to make decisions. So if you've 20 people around the room and everybody's talking, there's, there's very little going on. It just begins to grind to a halt. So invite the ones that need to be there. And don't invite everyone to every meeting, even for regular meetings. If they don't need to be there, say, look, I'm copying you in, but I, I don't need you. Not for this meeting. And think about time and day and location that works best for everyone. Uh, and think about whether virtual or face-to-face. Face-to-face doesn't really matter, you know, to really build that empathy. I mean, I live on online meetings. I have done for years. I work a lot with America and, and, and India. But, you know, if I want to build rapport and get to know people well, I will go down to London and I will meet them because you need to do it. But think about what you need, what day, what time. Uh, my favourites are 11 o'clock and 4 o'clock on Friday because that way I, when I say the meeting is going to last no more than an hour, nobody disagrees with me. Preparing to get it all booked and arranged. I know it sounds daft, but you need to do it. And issue the agenda in good time. You, you can't issue it the day before and then expect everyone to come to the meeting fully prepared. I usually say, certainly for charity board meetings, uh, I will give them at least a week if I can, and I will always make sure it includes the weekend. It gives people the time to sit down and read the papers. And they may read the paper and say, well, actually, it's something I need to look into here. I'll go and have a phone call with X. And then when they come into the meeting, the pair of them have sorted it out already. We don't need to talk about it. So that's good. Be clear on what the agenda items are. Who's going to lead it? So they know that and they're prepared for it. What's its purpose? An adequate time allocated. So agenda item A is the next Charity Excellence webinar. Ian's going to lead on it. And the purpose is to decide um, what the titles for our next webinar should be. And the discussion time is 15 minutes. We all know exactly where we stand. And we're thinking about, well, I'll tell you what, I'll drop into the YouTube channel. I'll just see what's up there already. <clears throat> see if there's anything there that stands out that I think would be useful. Come into the meeting going, I, I had a thought. Why don't I do a meetings one? Circulate the papers in advance to give people time to read these. Keep them succinct, plain English and clear. I've walked in and been given a 30 page pack up of finance. Sorry, mate, I'm not interested. Um, I am not going to apply with through 30 pages that I'm a volunteer. Right, what do I want? My finance reports were usually one sheet of paper and bullet points. This is the key stuff. This is stuff you need to know. This is the stuff that isn't working and what we're doing about it, what we think will happen. These are any decisions I need you to make. And then underneath it, where the accounts and all the details. But you could pick it up. You could read it in two minutes. You could understand it. If it's an eight-page, ten-page mental health paper from the clinician, something you need to put all that, that's fine, that's okay. Put an executive summary at the start. These are the six key points I really need you to know. So it's nice and clear. I'll make it a short one and attach documents with it. i put the documents online in Dropbox and people can go and see those documents and read those documents if they particularly want to. If I'm sending stuff out and it's going out and there's the chair of the finance committee, I will talk to the chair of the finance committee before I send stuff out so I can explain anything and I can clarify it with them. If there's someone who's a problem, God knows you get them often enough, and I know they're going to be a problem, what I will probably do is flop draft paper with that person and I'll have a conversation with them. Maybe I can win them over before the meeting and avoid a fight. Or I will amend it and they'll say, yeah, I'm still not happy with this because I'm not happy about A, B and C. So I go back into the paper and I go A, B and C. Then it comes in, they still don't agree with it, but they go, they've been listened to and, and that's not so bad. Give them time, make sure that everyone's coming into the meeting really clear. This is what we're here for. This is who we're doing. These are the decisions. This is how long each one's going to take. And I've got the information I need to take part in this meeting. And if you're not able to attend, send your apologies in good time and send comments. If, if there's a particular thing where you've got expertise, send your comments and and the chair can then represent those comments to the board. So the role of the chair, God knows I've done it for so long. And um, yeah, 
discussion remains focused on the agenda item to be discussed. It often just goes shh. And we're talking about last year's summer event. It wasn't absolutely fabulous and stuff. Guys, focus down. If you're running a charity board and you're having four meetings a year and it's two hours for each meeting, that's eight hours for absolutely everything. So stay focused on the agenda item. If you do need to have a chat about summer fair last year, put it on the agenda and make space for it. Everyone has the opportunity to speak and no one is allowed to dominate the conversation. Again and again and again, you see it in boards. Some they just talk and talk and talk and talk, and they just keep banging their agenda until you've agreed with them. I get that's not good. The good thing to do is the people who are most likely to go along with things that are being talked over young people, uh, people who have lived experience, you know, they're just the beneficiary, they're not really a professional. Um, those kind of people will get squeezed out. They may not feel confident enough to speak. And when you watch a good chair in action, what the chair will do is say, okay, yeah, that was really interesting. Okay, Mohammed, i really love to hear what you thought about that. And he gets to speak first. And if he goes, no, no, I'm fine, I'm fine. That's okay, that's okay. But he's, he's had a chance to speak. And, and bring those people out and give them an opportunity to speak. And what, I, I find sometimes, it's with, particularly with younger people, you know, I'm sitting in the room, I'm wearing a bespoke suit and I'm an old knacker and I've got a master's degree in business and all this kind of nonsense. I actually don't know anything particularly well, but that young person over there thinking, oh God, you know, Ian's been a chief exec. And if Ian thinks it's a good idea, I must agree with it. No, we don't want that. We don't want that. So what I'll do is I'll ask them before anyone else. What do you think? And often what comes out can be naive or it's a bit off bin, but they've got a point. And they've got a point that we can pick up and think, wait a minute, we didn't think about that. Really useful. Those diverse voices around the table are really, really important, but often they'll be swept under the carpet because everyone else is, is hogging it. Anyone not participating is brought into the conversation by inviting them to contribute. So if we get to the end of it, uh, and then we haven't, invited Mohammed to speak um, or whoever say, oh, okay, yeah, everyone's hand, right, fine. Uh, Mohammed, have you got any thoughts on that? And he may just have one throwaway thought and you think, wait a minute, my God, that's a really good point. And I've had that done to me. We, 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 we were looking at racism. I'm a child of the 70s. All the people who suffered from racism in my life were black and Asian because that was Britain in the 70s. And we did it and we wanted to make sure that we were absolutely on top of racism in the college. Um, and there was a young lady there of, of, of Asian heritage. And then the first thing the chair said to her before the conversation started was, what do you think? And she went, I have a suntan. As far as everybody in this town is concerned, I'm just a local lass. I'm not an ethnic minority to them. The people being beat up outside the nightclubs are Albanians, gypsies, people like that. And we were going, what Albanians and gypsies. This is the Cotswolds. Uh, and we have 30 different nationalities in the college and we didn't even know it. And she fundamentally changed our entire approach to combating racism. 18 years old, young woman. But she knew and we didn't. So the quiet voices around the table may have really important things to say and intervene if anyone's behaving in a way that isn't helpful. James, that's great. Thank you. We've got we've got your point now. Uh, could we move it on? Uh, Sue, what do you think? Um, yeah, yeah, James, that's fine. But I think Sue wants to speak. And push you down. Sue, come forward. Talk. Um, because Sue may not be able to get a word in edgeways. What research has shown is the famous 30% rule. Uh, that if you put a woman on a board, you're not diverse. Uh, and often should be talked over ever so nicely, uh, but should be talked over. And what research has found that when you've got three women on the board at that point, they have a sort of centre of gravity and the female voice begins begins to be heard. Uh, but it's chair. 
you can help bring in those voices that are being perhaps talked over or put down. Yes, yes, James, I know that Sue's only 18, but actually she's a student. She knows far more about what goes on around here than any of us do. We need to listen to her voice. Basically, James, sip it. Treat people with respect. So if you need to, clearly you would not put someone down in a meeting unless it was an extremist, but actually having a conversation with someone afterwards. James, it's the third meeting in a row where you've came in and we talked about this and you've said the same thing every single time and you've gone on for about 20 minutes and other people around the table can't speak. We get what you say, but, you know, could, could, you, could you just help let other people speak? Let, let them come in first and then and, and follow on. We do value your opinion, but, but we need other people to be able to speak as well. Is that okay? And it's better to offer advice on how to contribute effectively than criticise what he or she did. James Zippet is probably not terribly helpful. I mean, I'm a veteran, I'm not terribly subtle. Um, but James, it'd be helpful, you know, if we, everyone, it's, it's really good if everyone gets to speak. So could we perhaps move the conversation on? We'll just go around the table and get other people. So, so talk about the problem, don't focus on the individual. If you focus on the individual, you poke them in the chest, you poke them in the chest, they poke you back, then everybody gets all excited and they get all very fraught. Whereas if we talk about how we do things, I understand, I hear what you say, but I can't change what happened last year. What we can change is what's happening this year. So can we switch the conversation and look forward? Because we can make decisions that change what's coming. We cannot make any decisions about what's happened. And, and it kind of feels as if we're scratching over an old wound on that one. Yeah, let, let's move on. That'd be great. Fantastic. Ian, shut up. Next slide. So, if you've got an action discussion that requires only some people, um, delegate it to deal it outside the meeting or bring up options in the decision. I mean, I've sat in there and, and listened to two accountants. Don't get me wrong, I have nothing against accountants, but I've sat and listened to two accountants talking about technical stuff in the balance sheet while everybody else is dead. Yeah, fabulous. Um, so, if you get that, not the two accountants, but an issue that, that, that will... There's two or three people in the room are experts and really need to be involved, but other people, it's not their thing at all. What you could say is, okay, we take this X committee. So the issue is X. What we'd like you guys to do is to take it out, come back to the next meeting, <clears throat> give us an idea about what the options are, give us the pros and cons of each, what's your recommendation about what you think we should do and you know if you feel able to put a paper together and we'll circulate the paper out before the meeting it's gone if there are three experts in the room that need to talk about it let them talk about it they don't need to do it in the meeting um adhere to timings um they do slide you know something really important may suddenly be uncovered in an agenda item or something and you do need to spend this so this is not about being rigid but if you keep busting through your timelines, the stuff at the end of the agenda is going to fall off it. So if you keep doing that, maybe you need fewer agenda items and more time. But aim to bring it in on the time scale you've set. And the decision for each team is achieved. Been clear on who did what when. And so the chair, I will usually summarize and say, okay, that's fantastic. What I've heard is in summary, A, B, C, D, E, F, this is what you guys are saying. The decision is X. It will be done by Y. The deadline for that is Z. And we will get an update at the next meeting. And everybody goes, yeah, right, move on. So we, 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 we're quite clear. We all leave the room understanding about what it is we're going to do and who's responsible, et cetera. And it's, it's gone down in the minutes. And I have been to meetings. I went to one in the military at High Wycombe. And I sat in there for four hours and there were 20 people in the room. And as I left the room, I turned around to one of my colleagues. I said, mate, did we make any decisions in there? And he went, I think we may have, but I God damned if I know what they are and I've got a headache. So clear, everyone's in the same place. Everyone understands what's been decided. Off agenda items, they go to the end. <clears throat> so open the meeting up. I've had it. Uh, and tonight I want to talk about X, okay? Under any other business. What? We'll discuss it at the end of the meeting. Um, or outside the meeting. 
we need to look at X. Actually, is this a right thing for this meeting? Would it not be better if you and Fred got together, thrashed it all out and brought some options back? Well, yeah, 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 that'd be a good idea. Okay, we'll do that, take it out of the meeting. AOB, if people are having AOB, normal practice should be that they should tell you in advance so that you've got that at the start of the meeting. Uh, some, it doesn't always happen, they don't always have time, but good practice. If there's something I want to bring up at a meeting that's not an agenda, I will drop an email to the chair explaining why I want to do that. And the meeting ends on a positive note. Um, I've been there with the blood dripping down the walls and all the rest of it, um, but always on an up note. Guys, I know that was a tough meeting. There are strongly held views around the table, I understand that. Um, but we made progress, and progress is what this is all about. Um, we are now in a better place than we were when we came into the meeting. And I'd like to thank you all for your contributions to that, because I know it was quite hard for some of us in here today. Thank you. Uh, and the points are summarised, so we'll get to the end of the meeting. OK, we've had the meeting, we had four agenda points. These are what we've done. This is what we've done. Key points are this, 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 and this. We all agreed that. That thing there is unresolved, but Fred and James are going to take it out and going to have a look and bring it back for the next meeting. Uh, I reckon the next meeting is probably three weeks' time. Uh, everybody's diary seems to be fairly clear then. And so what happened is Sue is going to go out to everyone and just check where your availability are, and then we'll all come back. Once you've all done your actions, could you just email Sue to let her know? Uh, one of the things I do when I'm servicing the board is I will go out before the board meeting to the people who have had actions and say, could you tell me where you are? And I find that helps speed to them. What I would do is I would go into the draft minutes and I would put in secretary's notes in red. James has dealt with this. Everyone's happy. Don't even need to talk about it. Sue. So, hasn't been able to bring this back because we've had problems with lawyers. She proposes to bring it back to the next meeting. And I put them in the minutes in red. And then when everyone gets the board pack, they go through and they go, yep, 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 no worries. Ah, no, no, that lawyers have done that before. Must have a conversation with Sue to let her know about this. And they have the conversation before the meeting. And then when you walk into the meeting, everybody is in the same place. Everybody is up to date. And they all know where they stand. And we're all responsible for running meetings. It's a bad meeting, all of our bad meeting. Ensure we are fully prepared for the meeting. Read the papers. I walked in as new chief exec and the chair said, well, Ian, would you like to read your report out? And my response was, why? Hasn't everyone read it? And the answer was, no, they haven't read it. And what most of the meetings appear to consist of is chief executive reading reports out, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That was the whole point. You should not be reading reports out of meetings. Synopsis, take points, questions. So when I chair a meeting, the understanding is that you've come into that meeting with paper thread. Adhere to etiquette in using smartphones and tablets. That is... Don't. Just don't. I can't believe when I see this in meetings. Um, what you're actually saying to someone is, I would rather play on my phone than listen to you. It is disrespectful and you are not part of it. And if someone uses a phone and I'm chairing the meeting, but I'll say it's, um, and I've done it. Oh, Fred. Oh, that must be urgent. I tell you for a friend, why don't you take it outside? Oh, no, no, I'm just checking up my emails. Well, Fred, you know, either it's more important to be in here or, or it's more important than emails. I mean, I'm quite relaxed about it, but one or the other. Do you want to go and do your emails? No, 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 I'll stay here. Okay. Uh, another one, global thing, teleconference call and things. Uh, and I said, um, China, uh, it's probably best if you mute your phone because I can hear you typing on your laptop. Um, I'm not subtle. I don't suggest you do it, but don't. Focus on the agenda item. This is what we're talking about. This is what we need to achieve. I will often put in the agenda, make a decision on X. 
approval in principle, information, seeking your opinion, so that when we get to that agenda item, everybody goes, I know what we're here to do. It's amazing how often you can have conversations when people around the table don't actually understand what the purpose of that conversation is. So just spelling it out really helps. And actively challenge others, always positively and always with respect. If I say, no, that won't work, I've effectively just stopped the conversation. So, yeah, thanks, Sue. That's fantastic. Um, that sounds as if there's really quite a lot of risk involved. Are we quite clear about the risks? And are you really comfortable that, that those risks are going to be managed? Um, yeah, I mean, it sounds like a great idea. How confident are we that we will be able to secure the funding? And, and if it's going to cost that much, are we sure this is the best way to spend that money? I mean, have we explored the options of what we might do? So what I'm talking about is engaging with you about working on your project and trying to get to a solution. And I'm working with you to get to a solution. And, and it, it more generates conversation than that will work. And I'll have that conversation and I'll be thinking, this is not a scooby-doos that's ever gonna work. But it's not helpful to say it like that. And good ways to talk. Kipling's five friends, he called them. Who, what, when, where, how. When are we going to do that? How are we going to do that? Who's going to do that? And asking open-ended conversations invites people into the conversation. It doesn't stop the conversation dead. The one that I suggest not using is why. Because why is implicitly pejorative. It sounds as if I'm questioning your judgment or your ability. Why are you doing that? Kind of suggests you shouldn't be. So I avoid that one. But open-ended questions are really good ways to throw things out. So if you're reading, if you're seeing this project and you think, oh, I don't like this at all. What is it you don't like? It's really risky. Okay. How would we manage that risk? Who would manage that risk? And be sensitive to people's need for support and challenged or being challenged. Um, someone may speak up. They, it might be really difficult for them. It often is difficult to speak up. And often when you speak up, every, other people in the room want to do it as well, but they, they haven't got there. So if someone said, you know, Mohammed says, um, well, I, how are we on, on, on the cost for that? And then gets put down. I would go, actually, I think that's a really good point, to be honest. I think Mohammed's really right to bring that up. Where are we on the costs? And so I'm coming in and I'm supporting Mohammed because someone's tried to try to push him down. Or I challenge James. Um, but James may be the kind of guy who just does not take that well. There are people who think if you don't agree with them, um, you're attempting to undermine them. They, they don't understand positive challenge. So if I'm challenging someone and they're likely to explode, I will try, I will still ask the question, but I will try and frame it in a way that they will find it more likely to be acceptable. Not always easy. Um, and actively encourages those who are not participating. And don't talk over others and don't dominate the conversation. I'm, a, I'm do that. I get so passionate about things. I talk over other people and I really shouldn't and I should know better. We all have our faults if you're aware of them. And I will say to people, if you see me doing X, tell me so I don't do it. And don't make assumptions. Focus on fact. It's really interesting that people will often state their opinion as fact. That won't work. The beneficiaries would not accept that. Um, how do you know that? And, and, and people will often do that. And so I will focus on it and say the beneficiaries will not accept that. On what basis are we confident about that? They just won't. Yeah, no, that's not a basis. 
where's the facts and the evidence and the argument? So if you say, you know, we've done that in the last three times we've did it, they are, they were absolutely totally up in arms. Gotcha, that's a fact. I can walk, I can follow that. But be very wary. I think this, in my view, that would be wrong. But saying that's not ethical, the beneficiaries would not agree with that. That's my opinion. Opinion and fact are not the same thing. And be tolerant of diverse points of view. The McKinsey work showed that diverse boards brought different viewpoints and they often disagreed with each other. And it's constructive conflict. And as long as it was managed in a positive way, it's very, very powerful. But we need to be tolerant of diverse points of view. So I might fundamentally disagree with James's view on private education. He has a right to hold that opinion. And I have a right to hold mine. And we should both be able to respect each other for that. And, and, and if we're going to debate this, then I should debate it in a reasonable way. It's just a bunch of rich kids who get to run the country. No, 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 that's not helpful. <clears throat> that's not helpful at all. Um, but if you look at the percentage of people who hold senior roles in politics and industry and everywhere else, and including the charity sector, and you look at the percentages in private education, what you suddenly find is they massively over-dominate because they've got through and they've got the ups and things. And I will try and make the case. So be ready to apologise. Sorry, James, I didn't mean to upset you. Um, but, but, you know, th those are my views and they're honestly held. That I, I'm not being nasty. I, I, I believe that. Avoid taking offence. Um, you know, you're just one of those comprehensive law, you all slang it at us. I go, no, 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 no. I am a comprehensive oik, but actually I haven't got an ethical problem with, with, with private education. I just have a view that's this. So I should be doing my best to avoid giving offence. I should apologise even if only for upsetting people. And I should be doing my best to bite my tongue and not take offence at what people have said, because that way it just escalates things. Don't dwell on the past. Time and time again, I've said it. I can't change last week for you. I'm happy to look at last week as long as we're going to learn something from it that we can apply to next week because we're here to make decisions. Decisions change the future, not the past. So what I want to talk about is what we've learned from last week that we can apply next week. And what we're doing is we're looking forward and we're working with each other to create solutions. What we're not doing is looking backwards and allocating blame. I'm not saying don't hold people to account. You know, the guy that abused one of the women, that's a disciplinary. No arguments about that. But but in managing conversations, looking forward to the things you can change is less chess pokey, is more constructive. And what you're trying to do is to put yourself in the same way as that person and work with them to take you both forward to a solution. And if I disagree, um support your argument with facts and offer an alternative it is so much more powerful uh, i can't remember who told me this and taught me to do it so you know i'm sorry i don't actually agree with that i think that there is an issue around that because of this and this and this here are the facts we can talk about facts it's not a personal thing it's facts we can talk about the facts here's what we could do instead and I've often found that when I've been means I've had my fabulous ideas. I have lots of fabulous ideas. Some of them even work. Um, and I will put it on the table and some will go, oh my God. Um, and they will suggest something different. And my fabulous idea isn't quite as fabulous as I thought it was. But what it's done is it's sparked thinking that's taken to someone else. And the someone else is actually really quite good. So me putting that fabulous idea on the table was in actual fact a good thing to do. Although, in fact, being me, it was probably completely cowboy and everybody was fighting with the pants. But we've got to a better place. So rather than you're wrong, 
that won't work. Here are the facts that I think we need to think about. And here is an alternative that, 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 that potentially could, could be more effective. Don't blame people for things outside their control. So if I am responsible for the budget, the budget is off track, and it's because I haven't updated the accounts or I made expenditure decisions that weren't terribly good, I own it. It's mine. If something horrific happened, COVID, blah, 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 and the whole world went west and the cost control went out the window and there was nothing anyone could do about it, if you blame me for the budget overspend, that is blame. I can't stop COVID. So was it within my control? Was it my responsibility? Then I am responsible for it. If it was not my responsibility, or it was not within my control, we need to deal with it, but you can't blame me. And, and people get blamed for that thing all the time. I had a stand-up rollicking as a junior officer, and the excited senior officer said, and what have you got to say for yourself, McClintock? And the answer was, I wasn't there and it had nothing to do with me. And the response was, what's that got to do with it? I'm in here for a rollicking. Right? We understand. So don't blame people for things out of their control. Leave personal agendas outside the room. It's really difficult. I struggle with this as much as anyone. I have strongly held beliefs around issues like bullying and discrimination and racism. I would quite happily do evil things to people that do that kind of thing. I'm entitled to have an opinion, as long as I stay within the law. Um, I am not entitled to bring an extreme opinion into the room and foist it on other people. I am entitled to make reasoned and factual and supported arguments for a particular course of action, but it is not about my personal agenda. Decisions are always about what's in the best interest of the charity. So personal agendas should be left outside the room. And saying thank you. We just don't do it often enough. It's so easy to do. So easy to do. Um, I would often, when I was chief exec, go out to the managers or the directors and say, if any member of staff or a volunteer or someone like that does something above and beyond, I want you to drop me an email with the details and then. And I would write them personal thank you. Handwritten, fountain pen, so they knew it wasn't standard stuff. Uh, and when I would go into the board, I would say, by the way, under AOB, uh, so down at the Bradbury Centre did this fabulous stuff. Uh, it was great. I know it wasn't a big deal, but it made a big difference to somebody's life. And it's the kind of thing you've no right to expect her to do. And I would just invite the board to say thank you. Well, thank you very much. We'd write it in the minutes. I would phone up the manager of the Bradbury Centre and say, I have been instructed by the board to phone you up and say, actually, that was noticed. That was really appreciated. Thank you very much from me. And thank you very much from them. And what you do is be very specific about what they did and why. Don't just say thank you. We understand that it was really, really busy. We know that you're under a great deal of pressure uh, and you still went away and did that extra thing beyond. And that made a really big difference to that person. And we really appreciate the fact that you did that. And the people that don't get thanked are the ones in junior roles or the less glamorous support roles. Happened to me repeatedly where I see people up on the stage, oh, it's absolutely wonderful. And I'm sitting in the back stalls and think, I organised the whole bloody thing, but you've nothing good to say about me. Those people often get pushed into the background. Make sure they don't. The people in the kitchen at the events, the people selling the raffle tickets, the junior admin who stayed in the office till seven o'clock at night to make sure that everything was put away and done while the rest of us had all gone home. They were clearing all the plates and everything else away. Those people need recognition because they often do miss. And they will not forget you do it. They will not forget. It's really important. Mention them by name. Be specific about what they did. And beginnings and endings. Getting everyone to buy into how you run a meeting can be really, really powerful. 
I find the problem is, is when I see one thing and somebody else sees it slightly different, somebody else sees it slightly different. So within Charity Excellence of Code of Conduct, I think I've put it on the website as well. Um, and what I've often done with, with, with boards is sat down with the Code of Conduct and said, let's talk about how we work together. Let's talk about what we will make sure we do. Let's talk about what we want to. And let's just actually write it down. And then we all buy into it. And if any of us does any of the stuff outside that, we give everyone else permission to say so. I talk too much and I talk over people and I say to people, look, if I do this, please just say, Ian, shut up. I will not be offended because I just can't stop myself. Actually having that agreement is 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 really good. And then if you say, James, 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 Sue needs, let, let, let's give Sue a chance. He thinks, oh God, yeah, I've done it again. And, and, and it's not offensive. Uh, at the end of your first meeting, particularly when you've got new teams during the sort of storming phase and stuff like that, it can actually be helpful to go around the room and invite each person to contribute. They feel heard, if nothing else. What worked out well? Give me one thing that we'll do differently that'll make it better next time. Really fast. Go, 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 go. And see what comes out. And then you just feed that into the next meeting. And people feel they're engaged, they feel listened to, and you're actually doing things. Because you maybe I might be winding the guy up at the end and have no idea I'm doing it. So after the meeting, get the minutes or action notes out quick. That not instantly, but but get them out. Let people know about the arrangements for the next meeting so they can get it in their diaries and they can keep it clear. And individuals, each of us, make sure we've carried those actions out. People take minutes. Gone. I'll think about it two minutes before the next meeting. No, actually, it would be useful for that. And then I'll send an email to the secretary. I was told this is what I was going to do. This is what I've done. This is where I am. Thank you very much. And what I used to do as a secretary is I would then put that in the minutes as a secretary's note and everybody knew exactly where we were. We go into the next meeting, straight through the meeting because we've got everything to hand. Everybody's up to speed. We know what we're going to do. The agenda is very clear. Any AOB stick there at the end and we have all the information we need to make a decision and we all work to the same drumbeat. We're in agreement about how we're going to work together. We're all comfortable about that and it's really positive in the instruction and we make good decisions. And that's how meetings can be run. Um, they don't always. I hope you found that useful. Uh, I've chaired loads. I'm still learning. So if you're not doing all of that stuff, don't worry about it. I hope you found that useful. Thank you very much for listening to me.